For eight years, father and son fugitives Gino and Mark Stocko left a trail of fear, destruction and heartache across vast tracts of Australia. Eleven days ago, the pair pleaded guilty to murder. At the height of their reign of terror, they were among Australia's most wanted outlaws, heavily armed, dangerous and desperate. What the Stockos didn't count on was their brave victims banding together to take matters into their own hands. As Steve Pennells reports, the Stockos had gathered an arsenal of weapons as if all along they were preparing for a final showdown. In secret, secure spots on farms across the country, there are guns. Firepower of all shapes and sizes. I'm going through the side. On the land, in the right hands, they're a useful tool. Oh, she's a beauty. In the wrong hands, <laughs> they're deadly dangerous. This is a story of how two men terrorised outback Australia for the better part of a decade. Mark and Gino Stocco. How the father and son insinuated themselves into the lives of unsuspecting bush families, won their confidence, then inexplicably turned on them and destroyed their livelihoods. It's just like a bloody cyclone had been through the place. A cyclone with an electric drill and a hammer. I've got so scared. I've never been so scared in my life. You wonder, hey, yeah, who can do something like this? I arrived to find all the bolts and that the padlocks and stuff had been cut and they were laying on the ground and our guns were gone. And to know that someone's got, you know, three guns out there, wasn't a nice feeling, that's for sure. For years, authorities ignored the Stocko rampage. The Stockos are believed to be armed and dangerous. And when they finally did pay attention, the Stockos had set themselves for a showdown with the law that would end in bloodshed. These two are not typical villains. They're not disorganised antisocial men. They're well organised, carefully planned. Just as their work was described as meticulous, a lot of their criminal damage is meticulous. And they come back with a very clear intention to do the maximum damage that they can. I mean, it's a message. It's definitely about vengeance. And they won't catch us. They can't catch us. My name's Doug Redding. I live in country Queensland. I first ran across these two scum two and a half years ago. They were here for some seven months, left a trail of destruction and vandalism, theft in their wake. They've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I wouldn't want this to happen to anybody else. So the sooner this is brought to a close, the better. I advertised in the Queensland Country Life for a caretaker. Uh, I was in a position where I needed somebody to be here on the property of work commitments had taken me away. I just wanted somebody to virtually keep the water up to the cattle, keep the yard and the house tidy. That was all that was required. And they called you? Yeah, they answered, uh, answered the ad. Doug Redding owns a small property outside Cecil Plains in southern Queensland. He didn't warm to the Stockos when they showed up for work and board, but he hired them anyway and put them up in his house. And how did the first few weeks start with those guys? When I come back, the place was immaculate, the yard was watered, everything was, you know, as, as agreed, and they were doing it right up to scratch. But you could tell in their conversation that they were, um, you know, they were lying through their teeth of where they'd been and what they'd done for the week and this sort of thing. So 
So the alarm bells start going off? Not the alarm bells. I mean, I thought I was just dealing with a couple of, you know, die-hard liars, you know, but there's no shortage of them around, so... You put a lot of trust into these blokes, didn't you? Oh, certainly. Far too much. Mark and Gino worked for Doug for seven months. They'd have the odd argument, but after one seemingly innocuous one, with no warning, the stockers exploded. I was, you, you're trying to get, you know, comprehend what you're looking at. There were cattle wandering around everywhere and as I got closer to the shed, all the machinery's flat on the ground, all the tyres were flat. There's stuff, stuff scattered around everywhere. And, um, yeah, it was just, uh, just like a bloody cyclone had been through the place, like a frenzy, like, like some bloody lunatic's been at it, you know? That's really what it's like. Doug surveyed the damage and wondered why. Oh, I don't think these sort of idiots need a trigger. After their destructive rampage, Gino and Mark Stocko bolted, disappeared into the countryside they'd emerged from. Doug went to the police. When the forensic fellas come out here the first time, and before he'd done any work whatsoever as far as trying to find fingerprints and that sort of thing, he said to me, he said, I know who these people are. And I said, oh, right, oh. So we went looking for fingerprints and eventually found all the fingerprints they wanted. He said, I'll give you a ring tomorrow. And he rang me on the Monday and he said, yep. He said, it's who I thought they were. I said, who is it? He said, I can't tell you. And so began one man's very personal, very determined campaign to find out for himself where the pair had come from, where they were going, and why the authorities appeared powerless to stop them. It was just a point that I thought, you know, these bastards aren't going to get away with this, you know, there's got to be something done. Why did you feel it had to be up to you to do? I didn't feel it had to be up to me. I you know, didn't feel that at all. I just felt that uh, somebody needed to be doing something more than uh, what was being done by our authorities. But again, you know, the, uh, I don't blame the authorities. The, I don't blame the foot soldiers, the coppers on the ground. The people that are in charge of them, the politicians that run them, the bureaucrats in between, that's where the problem is. That's why these people have been getting away with this for so long right across Australia. February 2009, and the Black Saturday bushfires horribly scarred Victoria and the nation. 173 died in the maelstrom. Hundreds more were injured. Residents say there was no warning. The fire front came through like a freight train destroying everything in its path. Vast areas of the Yarra Valley and surrounds were devastated. It was a tragedy. For the Stockos, it was an opportunity. Our thoughts and our prayers go out to each and every one of them as they now try and deal with this tragedy and recover from the damage that, which has occurred. The smoke had barely cleared. The community was broken and at its most vulnerable when Gino and Mark Stocker arrived here, offering to help rebuild. Their work in exchange for accommodation. One young family let them into their home. It would be the worst mistake they'd ever made. It was probably March 09, mm -hmm. maybe around there, March, April 09, that they rang up and asked whether we would need a hand on the farm. Yeah, yeah, Nick, uh, Rick, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. No, I got your name through that, uh, what do you call it, that um, organic farming directory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I've done a fair bit, of, fair bit of fencing. I wondered if you had any work for me down there. I think he rang from Queensland, he said, and he said they're on the way down. They sort of seem to travel with the weather in the hotter months, in the hotter months of Queensland weather they were down here. Next Wednesday? Oh, that'll be great. 
Yeah, OK. See you then. Thanks, Ray. What were your first impressions of them? While they were clean, we uh, put them up in our visitor's flat. And they, even though it wasn't um, grubby in there, they cleaned it even more mm. spotless and everything looked good. And they swept the porches all the time in front of their little flat. The impression was so good, Rick and Sandra would welcome the Stockos back to their farm time and time again. Over the period of four years, they could have dropped in maybe twice, three times over the warmer months. But then they started rolling up out of the blue and treating the place like it was their own. We were preparing our breakfast. And they just were standing in front of our window. Morning, Sandra. So we can come on in, eh? I just got a fright because usually you don't have people at 7 o'clock and then they, they just said, oh, can we come in and... Oh. You had no idea they'd, they'd be coming? No. No, no. On a later occasion when the Stockos actually did call ahead, Rick told them to stay away and give the family a break. Well, all right, Rick. If I was dropping in, doesn't suit you, look. Then I suppose we won't. No, we won't. It would trigger a destructive rampage. Probably 12.30, we wake up. The whole house Ooh. had a orange glow to it, and... Uh, our shed was on the hay shed, which was only 80 metres from the house, was fully engulfed in flames. I raced out and we couldn't see anything to save there. It was, I think we pulled out one plough, but that everything was well engulfed in fire. Mm -hmm. I... And they were, I don't know, I... 40 metres high, the flames. Rick and Sandra alerted police. The investigation went nowhere. The Stockos were never considered. But the Stockos' vengeance did not end there. At the height of the bushfire season, they returned and set more of the Zipson's property alight. The damage bill was crippling. So, Rick, in dollar terms, what sort of loss are we looking at here? Well, all up, it's about $900,000 loss. We lost three sheds at $70,000. Each load of track, 110000 100 horsepower, four-wheel drive, another $100,000. And the rest, you know, you can count up the figures here. Must be pretty tough walking past here every day. Uh, it's devastating. It's... Uh, just don't understand it, how someone can burn someone's uh, livelihood like that. They're die-hard cowards. You know, they they come in the night, they burn people out, they thieve, you know, not just once, but, you know, one shed being burnt, coming back a month later, burning another shed. There's this pattern, isn't it, coming back and yeah, yeah. doing it again? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's victims out there that will never be identified. They, they, they're not, they don't want to be identified, and that's all there is about it. In Queensland, Doug Redding had been doing some legwork, making some calls, beginning to get a picture of a dangerous duo wreaking havoc wherever they went. He managed to get his hands on some photos. And I just started um, emailing their photos round to friends and getting it passed around like that. Started hearing stories back. The more I put them out there, the more stories I got back. Doug was doing the detective work that cops in three states somehow weren't doing. There was a big doona left here on a, on a bed behind, that they'd left behind. And when I went to take the cover off it, uh, it had um, a caravan park named on it. So I rang those people, emailed the photos through, and, um, yeah, so in that 
you know, put a very big piece together of a puzzle, you know, joined quite a few dots. Um, and I went down through New South Wales, showing their photos to everybody, every caravan park and any boarding houses, that sort of stuff. The frustrating part was that wherever I went, wherever I showed the photos, people would say, oh, yeah, I've seen them. I've seen that bloke. While Doug was gathering his evidence, Mark and Gino Stocco would pay a return visit to his property as well. I just had a, a gut feeling that they were down here and uh, thought, well, you know, I'll go and get those guns out of that safe and I'll get them up here. We'll see what happens from this point on. And when I went over to the gun safe and opened it up and they're gone, that was just, uh, you know, that was quite horrendous, actually. How do you know it was them? Um, they had the keys to the gun safe, or a keys to the gun safe. How many guns are we talking about? There's two guns taken, yeah. What type of guns? 3006 Browning and a uh, 357 Magnum lever action rifle. They are themselves? Yeah, yeah, very much so. 